The 9K35 Strela-10 is a short-range surface-to-air missile system which was developed during the Cold War by the Soviet Union. Its main job is to protect motorized rifle and tank units from air attacks by shooting down low-flying helicopters, planes, drones and cruise missiles. NATO calls it the SA-13 Gopher. The Strela-10 system has been upgraded many times to stay useful in today's combat situations. After a long time, I'm making a video about the Soviet vehicle again. This time about the history of the Strela-10. So hello and welcome and enjoy this video. In the 1960s, the Soviet military noticed a big problem with its air defense for its motorized rifle and tank divisions. The issue was that low-flying fast aircraft and helicopters could easily attack Soviet armored units from close range. So, to deal with this growing threat, they needed new, more advanced anti-aircraft systems. The 9K31 Strela-1, which was already being used to protect ground troops from air attacks, worked okay but had some clear weaknesses that showed up during its use. The Strela-1, NATO calls an SA Goskin, was a missile system which used optical guidance mounted on the BRDM-2, which was an amphibious recon vehicle. It could go after low-flying aircraft, but its range wasn't great, the guidance system could be jammed, and it struggled to hit fast maneuverable targets. On top of that, the Strela-1 couldn't work in all types of weather, which is less useful in bad conditions like fog, rain or at night. Basically, it was about as useful as the level 9 premium SPA in War Thunder saying, I got your back. Because, in fact, he doesn't have your back. As NATO air forces started making faster and more maneuverable aircraft, the Soviet Union needed a better system to handle these new threats while still being able to move with its mechanized units. To deal with these challenges, they created the 9K35 Strela-10, which was a more advanced surface-to-air missile system. On July 24, 1969, the Soviet leadership officially started the development of the 9K35 Strela-10 SV system. The program was like getting a bigger bet because the other kids kept stealing your lunch money. This decision came from the top, the, the Central Committee of the Communist Party and the Soviet Council of Ministers. The project was given to the Precision Engineering Design Bureau, or KB Tokhmash, the same team which had worked on the Strela-1 system before. At the same time, the Soviet Union was also working on the 9K22 Tunguska, which was a more complex all-weather system which used both guns and missiles. But the Strela-10 was meant to be a simpler, cheaper option which didn't need radar and could be set up fast. The main goals for the Strela-10 were for it to be mobile, affordable and better at engaging targets. To meet these needs, the Strela-10 used optical and inferred guidance instead of relying on radar. This made it harder for enemies to jam or detect the system. This was important because radar-guided systems were becoming easier to mess with using electronic warfare. While the optical system limited the Strela 10's ability to work in bad weather or at night, it could still function in situations where radar systems might fail because of jamming. One of the main differences between the 9K35 Strela 10 and the earlier Strela 1 was the choice of vehicle. The Strela 1 was mounted on the BRDM2, which was a lightly armored amphibious vehicle, but it had some problems, like limited off road abilities and not enough space for all the needed electronics. For the Strela 10, Soviet engineers switched to the MTLB, which was a more flexible multi-purpose tracked vehicle. The MTLB chassis had a lot of advantages. Since it was tracked, the Strela 10 could move much better over rough terrain than the wheeled BRDM2. It could handle tough ground like swamps, snow and desert sand without getting stuck, which made it perfect for Soviet military operations in, co in all kinds of environments. Also, some versions of the MTLB were amphibious, meaning they could cross rivers and lakes without needing bridges. The MTLB chassis gave more room inside for storing extra missiles, electronics and systems needed for the 9K35. This let the Strela 10 carry more ammo with 8 missiles total, 4 ready to fire on turret and 4 stored inside. It also had better space for improved radio communication and targeting systems, which made it more effective in combat overall. The MTLB chassis gave basic protection to the crew from small arms fire and shrapnel. It wasn't heavily armored, but it was enough for an air defense system which wasn't meant for direct combat. The Strela 10 was designed to stay behind mechanized units and protect them from air attacks, not fight on the front lines. 
The MTL Beast Diesel engine delivers 240 horsepower, which lets the Srela 10 reach a top speed of about 60 km an hour on roads and cover up to 500 km, so it could keep up with advancing mechanized units. Its torsion bar suspension and low ground pressure gave it great off-road abilities, which was important for moving through tough terrain while staying close to armored units. The development of the Strela 10 system moved forward in the early 1970s. By 1973, the prototype Strela 10 SV was ready for testing and joint trials were held at the Dunguskom test range from 1973 to 1974. These tests were done to see how well the system performed in real battlefield conditions and to check how effective it was at hitting aerial targets. The test results, however, were mixed. Several problems were found which delayed the system's official use. The main missile, the 9M37, had accuracy issues. It had trouble reaching the desired kill probability against low-flying targets, especially in areas with a lot of infrared interference or jamming. This was a big problem because, who would have thought, one of the Shredder 10's main jobs was to defend against fast low-flying aircraft and helicopters, which needed a high missile accuracy. Perhaps they ask themselves if this thing is trying to shoot down planes or chase them like a drunk dog. The reliability of both the missile and the combat vehicle was also a concern. The missile's guidance system, which used both infrared and photocontrast channels, had trouble locking on the targets and staying locked, especially during combat when decoys and countermeasures were used. Also, the MTLB chassis and the system's electronics needed improvements to make sure everything worked consistently in the field. During testing, operators gave feedback about the system's layout and ease of use. They pointed out that the way the equipment was arranged inside the vehicle made it hard to respond quickly to threats, which is really important for a short-range air defense system. Since fast reaction times are needed to engage enemy aircraft, the system has to be simplified so operators could respond faster. Despite these problems, the main missile and artillery directorate and the developers at KB Tochmash were still confident that the system could be improved to meet the needed standards. They reached a compromise. The Strela 10 wouldn't be adopted right away, but would go through more improvements based on the feedback from the trials. From 1974 to 1976, the system was updated to fix the problems found during testing. The 9F37 missile got some improvements, especially with its guidance system. The main goal was to make the photo contrast and infrared homing systems more accurate, so that the missile would be better at resisting countermeasures and locking onto fast-moving low-flying targets. The overall reliability of the system was improved by making changes to the vehicle's electronics and mechanical parts. This included rearranging the equipment inside the MTLB chassis to make it easier for operators to use and making the combat vehicle tougher for use in real field conditions. After all this, it turns out the refinements paid off. After more testing, the Nike 35 Strela 10 was considered ready and on May 16, 1976, the Soviet military officially approved it for service. When the Strela 10 was adopted, it filled an important gap in Soviet air defense. Its ability to move with mechanized units and protect them from low flying air threats made it a key part of the Soviet air defense system. It was built to hit targets within a 5 km range and at heights between 10 to 3,500 meters. It could take on targets coming in fast or moving away, thanks to its optical and infrared guidance system. Since it used optical targeting, it couldn't be affected by radio frequency jamming, which was a big advantage in electronic warfare. Even though the Strela 10 didn't have the all-weather abilities of more advanced systems like the 2K22 Tunguska, its simplicity, mobility and low cost made it a reliable and widely used system in Soviet motorized rifle and tank divisions. Even after it was officially adopted, the Strela 10 kept getting developed and improved during its service. Several versions like the Strela 10M, Strela 10M2 and Strela 10M3 were introduced, each with small upgrades in missile technology, communications and how it fit into the larger Soviet air defense system. These upgrades helped the Strela 10 stay useful through the Cold War, even after the Soviet Union had ended. Anyway, that's it for this video. If you have a suggestions for future videos or if you're mad I just insulted your favorite missile system, drop a comment below. Just remember, if you come at me, I'll be about as accurate as the Strela 1.
Anyways, that was all I had to say for today's video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you think I said anything that is not right or you think I should have added any additional information to this video, please let me know in the comments and share your knowledge. Besides that, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Изумительно, перфектно, белиссимо падает. Будем искать.